Hello and welcome to the Two Gals in a Mic podcast. I'm your host, Sue Curver, and on today's show, I'm sitting down with Jordan Watkins, who is a social worker, a suicide prevention coordinator, and a former boxing trainer. With a focus on helping people through the trials of adulthood, Jordan is on a mission to make people feel cared about because, as she says, life is hard enough. Jordan, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Sue. Well, I'm glad that you're here, and I would actually like to start our conversation by going way back to the beginning when we met. That was back in my South Carolina days when I was working through my own adulting trials using surfing as a way to do that. And if I remember correctly, that was the start of your journey into the world of social work. Why did you choose social work and why do you have a passion for working with veterans? Social work, I think, chooses you. I don't think that you choose social work. And I think if you asked most social workers, they would probably agree with that. I knew that I wanted to do something along the psychology route, but I didn't know that you know, a PhD and doing a doctorate program was going to be the life that I wanted. I felt that it was so pigeonholing and I wanted to be able to do a variety of things with whatever I continued my education with. So how I chose to work with veterans actually came before I decided to pursue a social work program. I studied abroad in college in Copenhagen, Denmark. I was there for five months. I chose that program specifically, that study abroad program, because they had a track in positive psychology, which I thought sounded really cool. And I wanted to know more about that. One of the assignments for that class, we needed to go and find a topic where psychology was used to improve issues within a certain population. So I went into the library and I was just like, that's such a broad assignment. So I'm just kind of browsing along and I come across this documentary and I think it was called something like Armadillo. I watched it and it followed 11 veterans, Danish veterans who were deployed over in Iraq, Afghanistan. And it followed these young guys before they join the military, follows them through periods of their actual deployment, and then really follows them when they get back. Just seeing the change that they went through in just such a short amount of time, just to see how their lives were so different when they got back and how they were really never the same again, it just really floored me. For some of them, that was a positive thing, but for some of them, it really wasn't. That documentary really impacted me. And that's what got me really interested in working with the veteran population because it just broke my heart to watch these young guys. I mean, they're at the beginning of their lives and they feel like they've already lived it. I found ways to kind of stay involved with veteran types of groups and initiatives when I came back. I joined AmeriCorps actually after college and that's how I moved to Charleston to work with homeless veterans. Wow, that can really teach you a lot, not just about yourself, but just about people in general. I went on from there working with veterans, and it's just such a special community, not just the veterans themselves, but the families that surround them. And I have a deep respect for people who, even if they're scared, they believe in something enough to go and fight for that. Bringing all of that back around, I knew I wanted to continue working with the veteran community in a mental health type of way. And I was just trying to decide, okay, so which degree is best for that? And I was really kind of caught between the licensed professional counselor route versus social work. And I had always wanted to come and work for the VA at some point. I was encouraged to look into the social work track because more social workers were working for the VA at that point. I think that has since started to change. But I think that that was absolutely the right choice for me because you can do so much with a social work degree. You can do direct care with people. You can do program management. Social workers are everywhere. Now, I met you when you were in the surfing community doing something very similar. And 
working with veterans. And I remember that you stated that surfing is one of the most athletic things that you've done, despite being a trainer for boxing and other athletic endeavors. What brought you into the world of surfing? I was not far out of graduate school with my MSW, and I was working at MUSC doing something totally different. I was working on an elder abuse grant, and Andy Manzi with Warrior Surf, he was the executive director at that point. <laughs> he doesn't like titles like that, but that's what he was. We had coffee one day, and they had had an opening for their wellness director position, and he asked me if I'd be interested in interviewing, and I was like, me? what about me looks like surfer to you? It really intimidated me because when you're not a veteran, sometimes it can be difficult to integrate into a community of veterans simply because you have some differences in your experiences. But then you also have this other subset of culture, the surfing culture, which I know nothing about. Never been on a surfboard. I'm terrified of sharks. I was just like, I don't understand, Andy, but yeah, I'll interview. Sure. Why not? I went and I met the team and I was like, that would be a really neat opportunity. And it would really push me outside of my comfort zone if they offered me the position, which they ended up offering it to me and, and I accepted it. And I went to Warrior Surf and my first surf lesson was two hours. It was brutal. You see the videos of baby giraffes when they start to like get up from the ground for the first time and they're trying to take their first steps. That's kind of what it feels like the very first time you're on a surfboard. Even if you think you're a good swimmer, you're not. Even if you think you are well-coordinated, you're not. You're like a baby giraffe for the very first time. It certainly is one of the most athletic things that I think I've ever done because it does take a lot of concentration and coordination when you're first getting started. And it takes a lot of determination and just, just not being deterred by failing over and over again. You just got to keep getting back on the board. For the record, I'm not sure that I ever graduated past the baby giraffe stage. I'm pretty sure that I stayed in infancy for the entire time that I tried to be on a surfboard. And of course, when you do get up on the board, no one sees it. No one. No one sees you get up and you're like, did you see that? And everyone's like, wait, what? Do it again. <laughs> I want to circle back to this thing that you were just talking about, the idea of being pushed outside of your comfort zone, which could potentially connect with that concept of positive psychology that we entered this conversation with. I recently read something that talked about how easy it is to confuse what is actually help as something that may appear harmful. Yet really, we're supposed to engage with uncertainty and with fear and even with challenges because these are the things that put us in our growth zones. How do you navigate uncertainty, fear, and challenges and in your world of work, how do you help others do the same? The advice that I give to myself and the advice that I give to other people is pretty much the same, which is don't think too much. That's really where people just get so caught up. They never move anywhere, but in their brains, in the space between your two temples, you've already visited like a hundred possibilities and none of them are good most of the time. I try to remind myself of that. Stop thinking so much. What's the worst thing that could happen if you try? In my private practice, I tell my clients this all the time. Stop thinking and just start doing something. Practically speaking, how do you start to do something? How do you actually move past that paralysis of analysis? I think you have to take baby steps. For example, I had always said I would never run a full marathon. I ran my first half marathon. I remember thinking this to myself, why do people do this? This is terrible. I can't even imagine doing this for 13 more miles. This is crazy. And over time, the thought would come back to me and I'd be like, no, 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 I can't do it. One day, I think I was just in the right mindset to finally be like, what's the worst thing that could happen? I'm not going to go out and run it tomorrow. I'm going to have to train over time, gradually build up my skill to be able to run 26 miles. And I think it's the same for trying things that seem scary. You don't have to go out and do the big thing right off the bat. 
you can do smaller things that are sort of like it and build up the skill to be able to then go and do the big thing. So that really goes into this idea of resiliency. We talk about resiliency quite a bit. What do those things mean to you? Resiliency is so tough because going back to how we talked about surfing, you have to be okay with continuing to not hit the mark that you're trying to hit and know that you got to just keep trying and that's the only way you're going to get it. Resiliency also asks us to part with perfectionism, which I think is is a hard thing to do too, right? Because nobody wants to have to say that they had to take the SAT seven times. No one wants to admit that they never got past baby giraffe stage on the surf. Yeah, board. because it's really hard. It's hard to have your ego bruised over and over and over again. But I think that that's what resiliency kind of asks us to do is let go of that a little bit. Because if you don't, you're not going to be able to bounce back as high because it's not about achieving the goal. It's about protecting your ego at that point. So these ideas of letting go, as you're talking about, correlate when you are in a season of disruption. This can be inconvenient. It can be life-altering and it can be life defining. Part of my invitation to realign brought me to Montana. That allowed me to become a stronger, wiser, more compassionate version of myself who's now living with purpose. Transition though is not always easy. What are some concrete things that you would advise we could do to deal with transition? I'm going to be a millennial right now. I'm a Taylor Swift fan. There it is. I am. I do think she's a good example of transition and continuing to kind of go back to the drawing board and really look at, you know, what's going on in my life? How can I use that as inspiration? Who does that make me now? Does that get me closer or further away to where I want to be? I can't remember if it was one of her documentaries or what something else that I saw, but she just plainly says, You've got to bet on yourself. That just really hit me like a ton of bricks because I was like, yeah, at times of transition, sometimes they are really positive and sweet and just a good place in your life. But I feel like those are not the ones that really move us forward as much. It's really the trial by fire that gets you into this new place like rising from the ashes almost. And I feel like that's a kind of a common theme where that can be a really lonely time for a lot of people. At some point, you just kind of got to embrace yourself and go, you know what, this is going to be really hard potentially, but I've got everything I need. And one way or another, I'm going to figure it out. If we can remind ourselves of that during times of transition, that setbacks are not disasters, you know, delays are not denials then that can put us in a really nice spot. I think the one nugget that people should remind themselves of more often is bet on yourself. I love that you're talking about messy because adulting is messy. It's going through the mess that helps us shift into purpose. It's these transitions that you're talking about that aren't always those sweet, easy ones. It's the really hard, messy ones As you've been on yourself, because you've done a lot of things, we've already talked about all these different transitions and shifts that you have made. What has been the most profound thing that you have learned about yourself through your own process of discovery? I think I've been incredibly lucky. Most of the things I've attempted, not all of them, may have started off rough, but it ends up on the other side. You're like, I was exactly where I needed to be at exactly the right time, even though I didn't know it then, I had luck in that I was exactly where I needed to be for me to end up where I am right now. Was it luck or was it following your intuition? Maybe a little bit of both. I do think that intuition gets better with age, gets a little more fine-tuned. Your spidey senses can go, "Mm, I think we've seen this before. Remember how that worked out. I think that intuition is really helpful, but 
kind of going back to one of your earlier questions, some things may present as helpful, but we may view them as harmful. Intuition can kind of be along the same lines. Sometimes we can look at something and go, I don't know. And it might look like it's not going to be a good thing for us, but in reality, it may actually be. Anxiety is not always bad. It's something that is actually can be a good thing. It's there to protect us and help us slow down and actually think about something. Is this a good idea for me? Should I weigh my options? I think that's also where some of the mess comes in. We can trip ourselves up. We don't need anybody to do that for us. We can do that all by ourselves. Have you had a defining moment or some time where you've had this profound aha realization? You know, or sometimes it's not one moment. Sometimes it's a series of smaller things that become a compilation of a defining moment. So I was actually in Guatemala on the Warrior Surf annual trip. So you spend all season trying to get in good swimming shape, good surf technique, because those waves are no joke. And there is no Coast Guard coming to save you if you are not a good swimmer. So you need to be like ready to go to Guatemala. And in the time leading up to Guatemala, it was right before COVID. So I think the world was just kind of on this precipice of a huge transition. Obviously, we didn't even know that we were there, but the energy was already there. It was like prime for all of us. So I was going through a really tough personal time and I had a really big decision to make, a life altering decision to make. That was in the back of my brain as I'm going out to the beach on Guatemala, looking at these waves going, yikes. Well, maybe the water will help me sort it out. So that was my first experience with a rip current and it was a nasty one. Before I knew it, I was way far out and of course I panicked. So I forgot everything that they teach you in lifeguard training, swim parallel to the shore and then swim in. Well, I didn't do that. I tried to come straight back in. So the waves were just bam, bam, bam. I mean, one right after the next. And because they're so big and powerful, you just kind of have to take a deep breath and just duck and just sit under the wave until it passes. And that's scary enough, right? Like you're holding your breath underwater and you're like, your body is like, no, no, this is not good. Get out of here. But you have to sit and wait. And so I'm just sitting here holding my breath. And I was like, well, I guess I made it to 30. I guess this is where I die. And I'm just sitting there thinking about all the things that I wish I could have done differently. And this big decision that I had been weighing for several months just comes right back and smacks me in the forehead. And I was like, you know what? I've made my decision. At that point, everything went calm. I popped my head up and I had a break in the the period of waves and I got on my surfboard and I paddled for my life to the shore and I got there. I think when you finally just make a decision about something really big that has just been weighing on you forever, you've refused to make a decision because you don't want to make the wrong one. So it just keeps you stuck. At some point, Maybe there's not a right or a wrong decision. There's just a decision. And so I finally made one. And I don't think I can really describe the feeling of peace that I had when I finally sat on the shore and was looking back at the waves. And I was like, well, I don't think I'm going to surf anymore this trip. That's enough for me. How did it work out? Whatever the decision was, how was the outcome? It took a few more years to really put the things in motion that needed needed to be put in motion. But I would say it's worked out well. I think I made the right one. You know, Jordan, we've been talking a lot about this idea of change and being in a period of uncertainty. And part of being successful when you are being disrupted, I think, is to practice self-care. What does your self-care routine look like? Do you have any specific or favorite activities or things that you do? I would be lying if I didn't say that sometimes it involves binge watching Netflix. I also really hate exercising. I hate it. But if I don't do it, I am crazy. You know, self-care doesn't always have to be this soft, flowery thing that you do, like have bubble baths. Sometimes they are the things that 
you don't want to do, but you know you need to do. And just doing them and being able to cross them off the list just feels so satisfying. For me, that's also a form of self-care is actually taking care of things that I need to do because that makes me feel productive and accomplished and that improves my perception of myself. Self-care doesn't always have to be really nice flowery things. If we're able to take a bubble bath, that means you're actually maybe thriving better than maybe you thought you were because you have the energy and the time and the resources to be able to, to do that. For some people who may not be in as good of a maybe mental or emotional place, self-care may look like I took a shower today and that's good. I ate an actual meal. That's good. So self-care really can look a lot of different ways depending on what's going on for you. Do you have a gratitude practice? I should. I tell my clients all the time, I'm like, should is a bad word. I don't want to hear that come out of your mouth. What I wish I would do and I, sh mm, I should do is write it down more so that you can go back and look at it. I try to think about it, like actually spend time thinking about what's something I'm really proud of that I did today. What's something I'm proud of my partner for doing today? Because that's important too. practicing thinking about things you're grateful for, for the other people in your life, not just about yourself. We can't get through this life by ourselves. So I think a lot, but I would like to add writing it out to my practice. I did that when I was in South Carolina every day, I would write three things on an index card and I would fold that index card in half. And I put it in this really big vase that was relatively inaccessible, but I did that for a year. And then at the end of the year, I turned that really big vase over and I emptied out all those cards, which were dated. And I read through all of those cards with the dates on them. And it was sort of this whole time capsule of the year and all of the beautiful blessings and different things that had happened throughout the entire year. Oh, I might do that. I'm going to steal that. I like that. Well, speaking of practices. One of the things, you know, we talk about gratitude a lot on the podcast, but we also talk a lot about authenticity and how to show up with purpose. Jordan, who are you and what do you see your purpose as being? It, it's really evolved because in my twenties, I was so serious and I got to go do all of the things and I was just such a go-getter in my 20s and I worked way too much and didn't enjoy as much as I should have. So when I got to my 30s, I'm in a place where I can actually have a little more control over my destiny at this point. And when I got into my 30s, I really wanted to leave that seriousness behind and slow down a little more because life just goes so fast. I think that really helps me in my work because what I do can be really heavy. You're meeting people in some of their absolute worst moments of their lives. Being able to kind of slow down and appreciate and have fun outside of my work really fills my cup back up so that I can strap in and really be present with people and focus on them. I don't think I could have done that in my 20s. I didn't have that figured out. I think authentically, I'm silly. Just by nature, I like to be silly. But balance is really the word that I'm prioritizing in, in my 30s. What legacy, whether it's professional, personal, or a combination of both, what legacy do you want to leave? When I get to the end of my life, professional, personal, both, I really hope that there is just a crowd of people who feel like my being part of their life gave them some sort of a second chance at something. Second chances are just a really big gift. Um, I've had probably two or three of them. I want there to be people who really felt like they got to really turn things around because I was able to change the way they thought about something or give them an alternative way of living their life or, or something like that. Knowing that somebody cared enough about them to give them a, the second chance and support them through that. 
Well, and I don't know if you always get that in your line of work, if people always give you that direct feedback, but I specifically remember sitting outside at a picnic table with you drinking a cup of coffee before I moved to Montana. And I was definitely in the change messy adulting phase of my life where I was looking for the second chance. And you were so compassionate and kind and just really dialed in with listening to me and just honestly, just being present in that moment. And I've never forgot that. What's next for you? Do you have any large goals or anything that you are driving towards anything that's on your bucket list? I haven't given up on the idea that maybe I would actually get back to boxing and get a match under my belt. I'm staring down the barrel of 35. So I'm kind of like, am I really doing this anymore? I don't know. (laughs) One thing I really didn't think I wanted at one point of my life, but as I get older, I think I really do is to start a family. I'm looking forward to maybe being in my future, but if it's not, then it's not meant to be and that's okay. But that's probably one of my, one of my bigger ones. I want to talk a little bit more about this boxing. Let us behind the curtain. Tell us a little bit about training, boxing, and what that looks like. I miss coaching so much. It uses a totally different skill set than the job that pays my bills. It was just really fun. I got paid. I would have done it for free. It was just so much fun. First off, I've taught everything. I think I started out with Les Mills. I think he was an Olympic athlete or something. And he started this whole like global fitness program and has several different formats underneath his name. And I taught body pump, which is the strength thing, RPM, which is like spin or cycle, and then body combat, which uses mixed martial arts. So I was teaching that. And that was one of my goals at the time to get certified in this program because it was so hard. You're doing the workout with the people and you're talking while you're like jumping in the air and kicking and punching. And it was just, it was, it was insane. So I thought, man, if I can get certified in that program, like you don't want to meet me in an alley, you know? So I got certified in it and I was teaching and a friend of mine was going to title boxing club. She was like, you should come check out title we actually get on bags and punch. And I was like, sounds fun. So I I went, I loved it. And I started coaching there. I think I coached with title for about four or five years. What I really loved about coaching boxing was just watching the personalities come out during class. I mean, the sweetest, calmest people would just wail on these bags. I mean, these bags were a hundred pounds and they'd be swinging but they're having the time of their life. It was one of the only places where a lot of the people who would come to my classes actually felt strong. And I really loved that. I loved creating a space for people that they could come in there after they had their butt kicked all day at work or all day if they were, you know, were a stay-at-home parent or taking care of a parent or something like that and just got their butt kicked. And they come dragging into the gym and they're like, yeah, I'm here. And then by the end of class, they were walking out with just a huge grin on their face. It just wiped everything away. And that was just really awesome. I loved that. Why is that so important to you to create that space and opportunity for learning, for community, and for that kind of social interaction? I think it's so important for people to have just one safe space where they can go and really just feel like this place, these people get me. Because I think so often in life, we feel misunderstood or devalued or overlooked or or whatever it is. If you don't have a place where you can go and feel connected and supported and seen, that is so hard. That is so hard. You need it for survival. Even the strongest of us gets our butts kicked on a regular basis. That's because of roadblocks. So how do you manage those roadblocks that want to keep you from success or keep you from moving towards purpose or the goals that you've set? There's a couple of ways to look at that. I think one thing to maybe ask yourself is, is this the right goal for me right now? Am I not hitting this goal because maybe I'm putting the cart before the horse? Maybe I need to 
look at something a little bit below that and then come back to this one. Or maybe I'm going about reaching this goal in not the most effective way. Maybe there's a different method I could use. If you're not hitting a goal, you need to step back and look at the drawing board and be like, well, what's not working? Then we can figure out what might work better. Do you have a favorite quote or a mantra or maybe something from a Swifty song that <sighs> helps guide this idea of staying in alignment? One thing I appreciate about Taylor is that she is gifted with the lyrics. I mean, some of the stuff she puts in her songs, I'm like, wow, that's so brilliant. I think my my mantra depends on what I'm doing. If it's something I'm training for or I'm at the gym and I really don't want to be there, but I've signed up for this class, so doggone it, I'm going to finish it. In those kinds of scenarios, I just say, just keep going. Five more minutes. And then five minutes turns into 10. 10 turns into 20. If it's something like mentally or emotionally tough, my mantra might be a little bit different. I actually just watched the Celine Dion documentary. I don't know if you've seen it, but it is so good. The song near the end of the documentary, there's a line in there that I think is now going to be my new favorite motivating statement. And it's, you don't have to move mountains, just keep moving. I started crying when I heard that. I was like, oh my God, that's so beautiful. And it's so simple. Jordan, you've shared a lot of wisdom about a lot of different things. We've talked a lot about uncertainty and change and transformation. What is your best nugget of wisdom for those who want to be brave and who want to follow their dreams? I think following your dreams requires a lot of courage. I think it also requires us to be realistic. You're probably not going to get exactly what you want the first time you try. Nine times out of 10, that's not how it works. So I think it's really important to remind ourselves that we have to be okay with trying something multiple times before we get what it is we want, but to stay determined and stay focused. Because if you want it that bad to try twice, then you want it bad enough to do it three times. Well, thank you, Jordan, for joining us today to share your insights and your words of wisdom. Adulting is hard, but you spread so much light and joy that you make it easy for all of us. And thank you listeners for tuning in. Without your support, the Two Gals and a Mic podcast would not be possible. So please like the show and share it with your friends. Then tune in again next week for another amazing woman who's doing extraordinary things. I'll see you then.